We're starting a new series today entitled, I Love My Church. Any church lovers in here? Yeah. Roll the video, baby. I love my church. I love my church. I love my church. I love my church because of all the small group interaction. I love my church. I love my church. We love our church. I love my church. I love my church. I love my church because everybody's so diverse. And it's so nice to be able to be in a room full of people that are different from yourselves. And you all have this universal thing in common, and it's God, and it's God's love. And so beautiful to be able to be around people that feel like family, even if they're not, and not feel judged by anyone. And honestly, it reminds me of what heaven's going to look like. So I'm winning. I'm winning. <laughs> I love my church. I love my church. You love our church. I love my 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 church. Love my church because the music is great, the people are great, and God is always in the house. be bringing some more of those to us over the next few weeks so if you dare look in your smartphone and make your own video edit it or just say it like you mean it and send it to info at metrotab.net you may find yourself on the screen who knows in the day of social media whatever you say is out there so enjoy it I love my church I found a couple of scriptures Matthew 16 verse 18 says I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it there are proponents in America today that say the church era is over. I don't really believe that. I was born a church kid. Now, um, mom is here, and in my, I was six weeks old. My parents took their first church, and it was a mega church. Had, like, no kids in the nursery. And I had a playpen up front. I was the church baby. So you, saw how, you know how big that church was, Sherry, that I was the only baby up front. But I told him in first service, Mom, what was the lady's name that took care of me? Vernie? See, Vernie was my ram in the thicket because I moved there when I was six weeks old and I left there about two and a half years old. So that was a, you know, I hit my terrible twos when I was there, which I didn't have those, I'm sure. Some of us have our terrible twos when we're 40, but just saying. But she was a ram in the thicket because there was no child care in the service and mom was on the piano and doing whatever, you know, pastor's wives do. And whenever I would get a little antsy in service, mom would go to take me out of this very small building. So everybody knew mom was standing up with the baby to go out. And Vernie would meet her in the middle aisle and take me away from her. See, it was a ram in the thicket. She saved my butt from a lot of tannings <laughs> that I did not deserve. I want to, know, I want to go on record as saying that. But mom said, you would go sit with her and she would entertain you and you'd be quiet for her. But see, God always puts somebody there when you need them to be there to save your soul. That's where the gates of hell would not rebel against Rita right there in that moment when I was about to get killed, you know. In, one of, in my dad's church, one of our staff members stood up to take her little, girl, her little boy out. And the grandson, the grandparents were in the service. He said, help, I'm going to die. <laughs> so... Those are moments in church. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says, All of us together are the body of Christ, and each one of us is a part of that body. Also, in, I want you to tell you that Metro Tab is not this building. This building is a gift. It's a vehicle that we use. But Metro Tab is a movement. It's a place where God changes lives, and all of us together take life steps together. It's more than a weekly gathering place, it's a family. And I have learned that in the last year and a half, more than ever before, since our daughter and son-in-law have been in Honduras. Brittany's been there for 18 months now, and they're facing a three-year marriage rule, so they've been married three years this December. Honduras tells us six to nine months past December, um, which we're not accepting in our spirits, but that's what they say. But I have learned over the course of the last 18 months that some of you have assigned yourself to be Brittany's family. And I want to tell you thank you 
when you sent her emails, you have FaceTimed her, you have sent her you know, messages on Facebook, whatever the case has been, you've helped her stay connected to her world in ways that you have no clue. Because she's living in a hotel right now, it's a two-bedroom two apartment inside the hotel, barbed wire around the entire facility, armed guard at the front door. Um, there's no getting in your car and going to buy your groceries. You get in a cab with a driver. Um, there's no just going out, you know, with your friends because your friends aren't there. It's not life as we know it. It's a very small existence where they are. And I know some of you have made it your business to be her family. You've made it your business to pray for them without even telling us. Because I know in moments that we as parents are the weakest, I feel your strength. And I want you to know that. So I want to thank you for being our family in these moments. Hebrews 10 says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much as the more you see the day approaching. I want to break down those two little words for just a moment. The word consider, the scripture says that we are to consider each other in this thing called the church, which means we are to have respect for each other. You can say this is the church, this is your family, this is your relationships. It means to have regard for the other person. It means to take into account, to care about, to be concerned about. The word assemble at its base level simply means to, to gather. We have gathered, we have gathered as an assembly here together. But it also means don't stop constructing your lives. Don't stop collecting yourself and getting your act together. Don't stop pulling together. Don't stop putting together. And don't stop connecting. So you've got to, to break a scripture down and see what is, it, what is it saying to me. So we are to consider. We're to be concerned about each other. Now, mom and dad did a good job of instilling in me a love for the church. There are some preacher kids who are friends of mine that are not in the church anymore. They don't want anything to do with God and nothing to do with church. They're done because of church people. There are also church people who are done with church because they're done. They've been hurt, and they're just over it. That's not what the church is called to be. Somewhere along the way, the church got redefined into a club, our four and no more. It's a segregated hour on Sunday morning still in America. So when you look at these words, I think we have a biblical command to construct ourselves with respect and with regard for each other. Today we want to talk about connecting. Next Sunday we'll talk about grow and the third Sunday serve. So today let's talk about what connect means. One definition is you attach yourself to something when you connect. You join forces with something. You unite with something. Now because you unite with something or someone does not mean you agree all the time. If you agree all the time, one of you is a robot. Oh, that's good. You know, if you want a perfect marriage, marry a robot. If you want a perfect church, go to one that has a video screen. Nobody ever talks to you about nothing. Nobody ever gets in your business about nothing. Connect means to bond. It means to link up. Proverbs 13, 20 says, if you walk with wise men, you will be what? Wise. But the, command, the companion of fools will be destroyed. So we should avoid people who feed our offenses. And you can find that person in your life, I promise you. Women tend to find these people easier than men. And when we find that girl, that girlfriend, who feeds our offense against our husband, she'll date him in six weeks. You'll find you'll lose your life. You may lose your wife. You may lose your husband. You may lose your church. You may lose your job. Because if you hang with folks that, have, that, that are offended and they feed your offenses, it makes it all that much worse. Don't hang with people who feed your weaknesses, who play into not your strengths, but your weaknesses. Don't hang with people. Avoid those who, defend, who will not defend you behind your back. 
Wow. Have you ever been hurt by someone who you thought loved you and then you heard what they said behind your back? Or maybe you heard what they didn't say behind your back. You heard they were just in a group where you were all of a sudden being trashed and they stood silent. You're not my friend. Avoid people who trivialize what's important to you. Oh, you want to start a business? Well, you can't do that. You're not qualified enough for that. Why is that important to you? Why do you care what your husband thinks? Why do you, why do you say yes, ma'am, to your wife and you just go do what she wants you to do? Because you got a good place to stay. Avoid people who feed your unfaithfulness, who feed your uncertainties. See, you should have people in your life group that are, like the Bible says, iron sharpens iron. Who in your life is sharpening you to be better than what you were? Now, some of those relationships rub you the wrong way sometimes. It's, it's been no secret that pastor has shared with you that my father was his mentor. And I remember very well the day, the moment in life when he told Walter Atkinson, do not sugarcoat it and do not put a cherry on top. Bill, I knew then that your son had lost his mind because dad was not one of those guys that would let you just fall off the bridge and say, oh, I am so sorry you fell off the bridge and you're drowning. How can I help you? No, he was the one in your life that 20 miles out, he would say, fool, you better listen to me. There is a bridge out ahead sign. You're about to bust it. So you need to listen to me. I remember very well sitting on their porch in Cleveland before we launched this church. We had prayed. We had fasted. We knew the direction of God and the call of God in our lives regarding Metro Tab. I remember very well sitting on that porch. And he turned to my father. He said, I want your blessing. This is what I feel like God has called me to do. But if you tell me not to do it, I'm not going to do it. Now, I, who was his daughter, sat on the other side of the porch thinking, really? We have fought blood, sweat, and tears. We have prayed. We have fat. You're going to tell the man you're not going to do it if he don't bless you? Really? Now, he was my daddy. Not his daddy. He was mine. But that was the trust he had put in a man that came into his life that loved him as much as his earthly father loved him. And he knew that Walter Atkinson, as his mentor and spiritual father, would never advise him to do anything that would hurt him. That's what a father does. Parents put guards around your, for your safety. And I heard him say, I believe you, son. This is what you're supposed to do. Be blessed. And I'm thinking, it's a good thing because I was about to be rebellious. I wasn't sure I had that, that, that same MO going at that moment in time. But when you take these people out of your life, then you put people in your life that feed your strengths, that stand for you behind your back, that know what's important to you, and they help you reach those goals. You have to learn the difference between a friend and a wolf in friend's clothing. See... A friend, one who sticks closer than a brother, stands with you regardless of the season in your life. Whether you have lost your mind or whether you got your mind all together. Now you need a friend who speaks truth. You may not like the truth they speak. But see, a wolf will say, I don't want to get involved. I just want to remain neutral in the situation. You know, even though this is your Judas, I want to be a friend to your Judas. And I can be a friend to you too. No, you cannot. The Bible says a double-minded person is unstable in everything they do. See, if you're a person who is pursuing excellence, and obviously you are, or you don't hang out at Metro Tab very long. Because we are guilty of raising the bar. Now, sometimes... Brent, I get tired of the bar being raised. You know, I remember a conversation I had with my dad many, many years ago, and it, it really, it broke his heart. Because I told him, I said, Dad, I don't feel like I ever reached the carrot with you. I'm always just, just right here, and I never reach it. He said, you're kidding me. You, you think that? Then he began to tell me how he felt about me. But I was raised in a family of high achievers. 
We have become high achievers. So if you're a high achiever, sometimes you just need to take a breath and breathe and chew on the carrot for a few hours. It's okay. Enjoy the moment. But if you're pursuing excellence, those who are comfortable living in compromise are never going to be happy in your circle. They may hang around for a little while, but they will bail on you because they can't cut it. They choose not to cut it. Let's look at some relationship levels. The first level is fun. It's nothing but shallow and it's issueless and it's amazing. You know, it's the kind that you can, you know, go to the hitched small group and go downtown to Tupelo Honey and sit across the table and eat with another couple and, and you think, oh, I'm glad we are not them. And you can just go home laughing. They're so jacked up and we're just so glad we're not y'all. Y'all having hors d'oeuvres tonight? You gonna have bread and butter? And there's no issues because you're not involved with them. It's just fun. So that's, you know, some folks make their marriage plans in that relationship level right there. You know, they met on the internet and in 12 days they're married. Honey, anybody can be cute for 12 days. Take me on a cruise to Hawaii. I'll be the cutest thing you've ever seen in your life. I won't fuss. I won't argue. Give me a ball cap and a swimsuit and a good book and leave me alone. I'm the best person to get along with. But now, after the 12 days are over, we're coming home. And we're going to move to level two <laughs> real quick. There's a little more requirement of responsibility and commitment. See, when you start, when you hang past the fun and shallow stage, then we start expecting things in our relationships. I expect you to keep your word. I expect you to be who you're supposed to be. At this level, most folks drop out. And the trouble is, you don't date them long enough to give them time to drop out. Nothing wrong with meeting somebody on the internet, but you better find some, ex, some outside the internet time with them. Get outside the emails. Have some face-to-face, -face, not on FaceTime. Not FaceTime. I mean like good old-fashioned FaceTime. Like I'm in your face right here. Like, hang out with them. Hang with them long enough till they lose their temper. Because I promise you they have one to lose. When they start losing a piece of their mind, hang out long enough to see how they're going to react. Tick them off real bad. I mean, tick them off real bad. If he picks up a bat, you better hit him first, sister. <laughs> Next time he takes a nap, sew the sheets up and beat it out of him. And he'll leave when he wakes up. And if he don't wake up, then you better leave and call 911 say, there was a mistake in my house. <laughs> we'll help you get out of that mess. <laughs> so see, most folks drop out at this level, but there's an even deeper level. We call it level three for our purposes today. It's in, it's in your face. It's when you begin to forge your life with another person. And you're willing to give up what brings you comfort to make them better. It means, you know, if... If your friend calls you and they're in an emergency, you don't say, well, baby, I got a hair appointment. I'll catch you next week. It's in those relationships that you put yourself second and they come first. It's that friend that sits closer than a brother. And see, if you promote a person to this level too soon, they'll falter. Some folks can fool you on this level for a while. But when push comes to shove, and your season of struggle gets a little longer than what they anticipated, they'll bail on you. See, in relationships, we have to do what? We have to embrace what is wise and reject what is foolish. You've got to value yourself enough to qualify your relationships. We've asked some folks to share with you for a few minutes um, what connecting to Metro Tab has meant to them. Beth and Monty? We're going to call this a filibuster message. We'll be here till 3 o'clock. <laughs> We're serving lunch in the lobby. Ooh, Beth's going to talk this time, right? See, look at this. That's the joy of doing two services. You can correct what you didn't like and change what you don't. Don't hold the bottom. Don't hold bottoms. Just hold the middle. <laughs> okay, Beth gets to start this time. <laughs> okay, I'm really nervous about talking in front of people, but 
you're supposed to hang out with people that stretch you, and here I am. <laughs> um, we're talking about what connected us to this church. The moment I walked through the door, I was connected to this church. Everybody was very friendly to me. They just made me feel like I was at home, and that's, what I, that's where I am. These are all my friends. Steve and Rita, you always push us. I feel like you're always talking to me. You're teaching me. You're my friends that teach me. So. That was short and sweet. Okay, anyway, good morning. Okay, the, one of the main reasons that, that I am connected to this church, like I said in the first service, is it's like everyone, they kind of get stripped down, you know. They leave their race card at the door. They, you know, it don't matter what race, what gender, whatever. Everyone's here for the same reason. Everyone's here, you know, that loves, loves God. And everyone seems like they love each other. It don't matter if, if you're rich, if you're poor, you know, what color, you know, and, and that's where I want to be. You know, there's no one judges us, you know, and, and we, we, we don't judge anyone. We just, you know, we just try to love everybody. And I believe that's what, you know, that's what God wants everyone to do. So uh, that's one of the main reasons. And like I said, we had a, uh, we had a meeting, I don't know, a couple months ago, and I spoke about, about Stephen Rita, and I was like, most churches you go to, the pastors, they seem like, now they may not think that, but they seem like they're up here, and you're down here. You know, it's like they're almighty, and, and you know, you're peons. These guys act like just my good friends that's, they know a little bit about the Bible, than, a little bit more about the Bible than I do, and they're, they're guiding me and teaching me, you know. And I don't care how long you live, you can always learn something from someone. So that's, that's the main reason I'm here. We're glad that Monty and Beth Mills are here. Michael and, Mar Michael and Martha. I, should say, I could call her Mary, but she's not a Mary. She's a Martha. Actually, she has a sister named Mary. And I got to know, there was one Sunday I was headed through the lobby. I guess I had a corrective look on my face. And... And Michael was sitting out there on one of the benches, and he just started laughing. I said, what is the matter with you? He said, I live with that spirit. <laughs> so I hope that's a good spirit. <laughs> You'll know uh, what a great blessing to be at this church is. I've been here, we've been here a little over two years, and I have to thank God through my Christian walk, through my whole life, that God has joined me and put me in great ministries. From 79 to 89, and 89 I went through a divorce. My wife left me over for being involved in church ministry. And I know a lot of us have that story. In 93, he brought me Martha, give me fresh and a new way of life, and a great partner. And I'm so grateful for that. And I'm so grateful to be at a church that has diversified, that has a love for people. I'm thankful that I, I have a pastor that he doesn't have an entourage of 15 men behind him that I have to get to him if I want to relate to him. I know there's a purpose for that in ministry, and sometimes that has to happen. But I thank God that I can relate to him as he is. I thank God for Rita that... She's like the spirit here. She's brassy. She tells you like it is. Steve is kind of like myself. He's more laid back. <laughs> but here I am, like most people, trying to say what, what you say and not get in trouble when you get out of here and get critiqued when you get out of here. I'm very thankful for this church and what it means to me and to my family, and I let the person who speaks the most speak. He is in so much trouble. <laughs> really. I got a text earlier this week from Pastor Rita that says, um, you know, would we be glad to say something? And Michael and I really both like to talk, so it's just not me, okay? Um, but what this church means to me, we're talking about connecting to our church. 
two years ago, I was very, very disconnected. I didn't care if we ever went to church again. I'm born and bred. Had 14 years perfect attendance in Sunday school. Um, was there, missed every Saturday night slumber party because I had to be at church on Sunday morning. So, but anyway, we had been on vacation and it was a Sunday morning. We had got up late. Michael was going to go ahead and go to church and I was not going to go. And he said to me, he asked me very nicely if I would come to church here that Sunday morning. And I didn't want to come, but I did. He said, we've passed by that church for seven years. We're there. We see it all the time. Let's just go. So very begrudgingly, I came that morning. And the minute the door was open, I felt God. I knew this is where God wanted me to be. There's a season, and I am so grateful that this season came along. But that Sunday morning, there was a blonde standing at the door with this great big smile. And she said, good morning, Joy Roberts. And that meant the world to me. We came in and we sat over here. And pastors have a sermon called The Ugly Duckling that I have asked that they bring back. Because it was the story of the ugly duckling. And that was me. And from that moment on, I knew that this was where we were supposed to be. Michael wasn't convinced yet. It took a little convincing. But this is where we're supposed to be. And the relationships that I've made, the two pastors that I have, when I came to church here, I told this lady, I won't need you. Do you remember that? I need her almost every day, you know. But this is home, and this is where we're supposed to be. And I love my church, and I am so glad I'm no longer disconnected, but completely connected to my God through my church. Ben? I'm going to nickname you and call you Big Ben or Little Ben. Is there somebody bigger than you? Good morning. Um, let's talk about connecting to our church, what I love about my church. Um, when I was asked this week to uh, be able to speak for a little bit, I was looking up what connected me. Um, in the dictionary, it says, join together so as to provide access and communication. That was one of the verses, I mean, one of the... Uh, as a verse to me, because I think of it as uh, Matthew 8, 20, 18, 20. It's there where two or three are gathered, he will be there in the midst. And he's always in this place. It seems like every time you come in Metro Tab, the cloud of God is here, you know what I mean? You can come here, you, whatever you're going through in life, just, you just feel the, the, the rain of God in here. And the other one I like, it was preaching to me. It says, it's a link to a power or water supply. Metro Tab has been to me a power. It has been my water supply. Um, throughout the years here, I've been here five years. I've been going through some things, and uh, this has been a place where I come and connect. This has been a place where I come and recharge. This has been a place that I come and just cry, and when I leave here, I feel a lot better because it's, it's a shade. It is comfort. When you come and when you come into this door and you leave the church, like they said earlier, you have a pastor that's out there shaking everybody's hand, learning everybody's names. Coming where I come from, you have a pastor coming here, he walk right back to his room when he's done after service. He never comes out there and connect to you. Like I said, we're our family. This is mama, and that's daddy. Our daddy here, like he said earlier, he's our comforter. He wants to, wants to comfort you and give you peace. This is the disciplinary. She will set you straight. But... In every household, you need that. And that, that's what we get here because you got to have, you got to have the whole body. You just can't have a bunch of comforters and a bunch of disciplinary. Otherwise, you won't have people in here. So uh, that's the reason that I love the church and plus the diversity here. Uh, as you can look around, it's every color, it's every race, it's every creed, it's every financial group, it's everything. But we all connect with each other. And uh, I just want to thank y'all for being my family. I don't have family here, uh, so y'all are my family. I thank y'all. I thank y'all, uh, ladies, that pour into my daughter. You don't know how much that means to me for y'all to be able to pour into my daughter, Tanya. Dorley, thank you very much. You speak life to her. You allow her to work. You allow her to dance. 
you give her opportunities to do the things that it means so much to me. Um, and there's so many more that do so much for her. And I thank y'all. That's what a family does. I don't know how I got the reputation of being the disciplinarian. They don't know you very well, do they? Let me tell you something about your daddy. I may boil faster. He boils slower, but once he comes to a full-blown boil, you're going to hurt whether you're guilty or not. It's over. And I'll be the going to say, give him another chance. Give him another chance. I chewed him out. They're doing better. Here we go. It takes a, a village. Brent and Charity Face Meyer. It's like, what else is there to say? Um, I mean, everybody else has kind of summed it up and pastor so eloquently this morning um, covering on what church is. And um, I know for us, when, when I walked in the door the first time, it was a, a breath of fresh air. Um, it was the first time in a while that I really breathed. Um, and I knew that I was home because this is family. Um, pastor talks a lot about being uh, barrier busters. And when you live a life of purpose and you're pursuing your passion, your destiny full force, and um, you're not on autopilot, it can be very draining because it's easy to go through life just going through the motions. But when you snap out of that and God calls you to something, he calls you out of your comfort zone. And, um, and that takes a lot of energy. So for me, the biggest change since I've been here is it's been a place of rest. It's been a place of peace. It's, a, it's been a place where I can recharge, where I'll bump into somebody in the hallway and they'll just say the perfect thing at the perfect moment. And I hope that I have the same opportunity to give that to somebody else. Um, on Thursday nights, if you guys don't make it to Thursday night, shame on you. This, the house that we have, the presence that we have, that Devin can just, you know, he just ushers us right into the very throne room and, and into the inner chamber where we get to worship and put everything that's crazy in our life outside and just come in here for an hour and spend it one-on-one -on -one with him. I mean, there's nothing more refreshing. I think on Thursday I told Martha, I said, I got to go in there tonight and lick my wounds because, you know, it had been a tough week. And just to step into the presence of God and to be able to be in this house is just an honor and a pleasure. Um, so after that first experience with Charity, she came home and told me I had to go. Um, but, uh, you know, um, for a little bit of our background, both of us were raised in church and uh, my parents served in the church, her parents were missionaries. And so we understood church, not just from a corporate setting, but from a, a, the business side of church, the, the, the background that a lot of people uh, don't know about. And if growing up, especially for me, seeing my parents hurt by people in the church, we lived a very isolated, we, we went to a church of 5,000 members and I knew maybe three of them, right? And, um, and then when we got married, we moved uh, a bunch of times. We moved nine times in the first seven years of marriage. And so uh, finding churches were always difficult. And I was also raised uh, Pentecostal, Charity was not. And so um, finding a church that we could both go to, and she's been very gracious over 18 years of marriage because she, she would always kind of let me pick the church, uh, which the diversification in here is amazing. Um, which is one of the first things I noticed because I don't usually like going to church with white people. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, and uh, which it's amazing that she married me after our first church, after I brought her to my church up in Cleveland. So, but uh, it, it's, we all, she, she's always just tagged along to the churches when we would find them. And then when we were there, because we moved so much, we were always at arm's distance. And so when we, when we walked in the church for the first time about 18 months ago, um, there was just a different presence here that unfortunately many churches just are not getting right. And, um, and I looked around and, and not in a, you know, cause we were, we were really hungry. I mean, we had moved back. We had been back, uh, at that time, four years. And you tell people about your faith and all that. And the first question they ask is, well, what church do you go to? You know, and, and after the first year of saying, well, you know, we're still looking, you know, that's kind of understandable maybe, but after your third and a half year of going, well, we're still looking like you're kind of a flake, you know? And, um, 
but it really we wanted we wanted because we know this is home for us this is where charity we were back home and so we didn't we we wanted to take our time because we were like if if we finally find a church that we both can fit into we want to be a part of that church we wanted to have a covenant with the pastorship you know and um unfortunately because of um our our what we do for a living and and where we're at and we step outside of our comfort zone, it's tough to go to a church when you're living outside of your comfort zone that they teach, they keep teaching safety, right? And you've got, you've got to be part of an organization that stretches you and wants you to do better. And so to find pastors that, that are grounded in the word, but know that we can live a life to the fullest um, and are accepting of, they don't expect you to walk in already living a life of fullness, right? That's rare. And um, to see the impact that they're having on our kids and um, we're just blessed. And, uh, and so for those of you that, that maybe, you know, we, we still feel like we're babies in the church. We, we've just started really connecting uh, with individuals and there's so many more of you guys that, that we're excited to, to get to know better. But if, if, if you're really, really new to the church, just understand that, you know, get, get connected. There, there's no, um, th- there's no falsehoods. You know, do you get what I'm saying? Like the mask, nobody's wearing masks. And I think if you're used to the church world, you know how rare that is, but get connected. And if there's something that the church, and I'm not trying to speak for you guys, but if there's something, this is the spirit that I feel, but if there's something that you want the church to do, or you're like, you know what, we're missing it here. You know what? We've been waiting for you to get here so you can do that. And, um, and you know what, just, just plug in, find, find your gifts, get with Adam and the pastors and, and Devin, and just find out what it is and, and plug in and be a part. This is a working church. This church is not designed for you to sit in the back and just come in, and this is a working church. So anyway, we just appreciate you guys, and we're just glad to be part of the family. I want to book you like every six weeks for a shot in the arm for the church. That's good. (laughs) We'll pay you later. That was what we offered you. Wow. I love the body of Christ. All I have ever known is the body of Christ. You take the good with the bad and the ugly. But I found enough good and enough great and enough heart that I still believe in the church. I still believe in the church. And I still believe that in this environment, you can connect to family. You're born to a biological family, but that biological family has to choose to be family. So we have come into a church and we have to choose to be family in this church. And I think we're doing a pretty good job of it because we're diverse and that's good. I like the diversity. I'm kind of like Brent. You know, I tried the all white church and I'm like, I'm out. See you, bye. I need some Hispanics. I need a little little color in my life. Now some of y'all, God loved more than us. He gave you color and you have it year round. Some of us had to lay out to get our color. And we only lay out when it's warm. So we get whiter, you know, in the wintertime. So don't, don't fault us. We can't have, we had white parents. We can't help it. Sorry. You know, you are who you're born to. No matter if they're, if they're polka dot. Here's a prayer I want to pray over you as we close. Ephesians 3, 16 through 20 says this. I ask the Father with his, with his great glory to give you the power to be strong in your spirits. Metro tab that he will give you that strength through his spirit. I pray that Christ will live, be active, reside in your hearts because of your faith. I pray that your life will be strong in love and be built on love. See, when you've been hurt, you gotta risk loving again. Or you just put a wall up and you live your life by yourself. Now, I have adopted the half wall theology in my life. Everybody has a wall and you decide how high it is or how, you know, if you're wall-less and you're barrier-less, you're crazy. So I've got a half wall and your half wall lets you just embrace those crazies and pat them on the back and you can eat lunch with them, but they ain't coming in your inner life. They got to climb over that wall to get in your life. 
So a half wall is not so bad. Don't wall it all the way up. People got to fight to get you to speak to them and, and get anything. Because you have walled out so many possibilities. And often the baggage that we carry with us, we carry to the next relationship without having dealt with it. And we make that person pay a price for our hurt, for what somebody else did. It's, hard, I'm not, it's easier to say just get over it. It's harder to get over it. But when you forge your life with somebody, you can get over it. And you can trust again. And you can love again. And you can love for a lifetime. Here's the rest of this prayer. I pray that you will have the power to understand the greatness of Christ's love. His love is crazy wide for you. It is incredibly long. It is beyond high and it is so deep you can hardly fathom. You can't, we can't tip the edge of the iceberg of his love for us. We are his only plan. But when you can start to, to understand that there is a God and he does love me. Actually, he's cared for me every day of my crazy, jacked up, messed up life then you can be filled with everything God has for you. And once your life begins to fill up, and often he fills us up opposite. He starts in your head, you start thinking about his love and it gets in your heart, you start believing it. And he start, his love starts filling up and pressing out all the trash that somebody put in you that was never meant to be inside of you anyway. All the trash talk, all the junk that's been spoken of you by school teachers, parents, I apologize for their insanity. The spouse that spat poison at you, the sibling that called you something you're not. Whatever the case may be, whatever the abuse you've suffered, you start filling your head with his word. And I promise you, it'll get down into your heart. And the more he fills your life from the head, to your toes. He will wash out all the trash, all the depression, all the negative, all the junk, all the crap that has been poured into your mind about who you are not. So let him fill you up. I dare you to start thinking God thoughts. Just think God thoughts and it will change how you focus on your day. And it's one human in the earth. I want pastor to come stand with me. I want you to know that there are two people on the earth if there's nobody else in your life. Stephen Rita Ball, believe that you are not all you are yet. You're not all you're supposed to be yet. There is greater purpose. There's higher love, deeper heights. There's, you're just not there yet, baby. None of us are. So, once you embrace his love, then you can be feel everything God has for you. With God's power working in all of us together, he can do so much more than we could ask individually or corporately that we can think, imagine, or ask. That's huge. So when pastor says, your best is yet to come, he really believes it. My dad used to call him ignorant. He'd say, boy, you just don't know it can't be done. So I pray to God, Metro Tab, that you are ignorant today. That you are ignorant to what you cannot do. That you are ignorant to what they're saying about you. Tune that mess out and become the person God has called you to be. Become that person. I just want to say how much I appreciate all of you. I'm proud of you. I'm, I'm thankful that when I meet new people in the community, whoever they are, whatever their story, some of them still working on their testimony, and they say, well, I don't have anything to wear, or I haven't been to church in a long time. I can tell them that this is a safe place. You can come just like you are. We don't try to clean the fish before we catch them. You know, you come just like you are. You can come in your shorts and your flip-flops or with your son to go to meet and hat. It, it doesn't matter. You come here. And we're not going to judge you for where you are. If you're still working on your testimony, the Holy Spirit, His role is to convict us and to lead us. 
Our role as the church and our role as pastors is to love you where you are, to pray for you, to be here to help you through the valley, and to celebrate when you're on the mountain. And we've been very intentional about trying to grow a church that looks like heaven and it's a safe place. And I guess we have one of our greatest strengths is also our greatest challenge. I think our greatest strength is our diversity because we have people from all walks of life. But when you first come here, you know, because the church hour on Sunday morning in America is the most segregated hour in America, when you first come here, it's like, oh, well, where am I? Because human nature is to try to find somebody that looks like, like you. You try to find somebody, maybe they're in the same vocation, they look like you, and, and that's just human nature. So when you come here, it's like, wow. But if you'll stay long enough to get connected, you'll not only find yourself and somebody that looks like you and you can have common ground with, and maybe they're in the same vocation and same background, same walk of life, but you'll also find somebody that's different from you. But you'll love them and you'll connect with them. And it'll be amazing because God puts relationships together like that. So it's a safe place. And I love my church because this is God's church. It's not about one body or one group of people. We are part of the kingdom of God. We're kingdom people, but I love you and I love Metro Tab and I love the kingdom of God. And you can help us by spreading the word that this is a safe place. It's a fun place. And you can come just like you are and you won't be judged. You'll hear the truth, but the truth will set you free. So come and celebrate with us. Tell your family, tell your friends. Let's grow the kingdom of God by loving each other and building our church because this is where God has placed us for such a time as this. It's no accident you're here. God's got your number. And this is our season. Amen? I love you. Oh, you didn't hear me. Turn the volume on your hearing aid up. Turn it up. Look at me. I love you so thankful for you I'm proud of you and I really really do believe that your best is yet to come would you stand with me I want to pray for you and then we'll close together father I thank you so much for Metro tab I thank you Lord for this family I thank you Lord that you have given us a place that is a, a refuge a safe place a shelter from the storm and rain I pray for every person here, those listening or watching by internet or TV later. I pray, Lord, for those that are in this room right now, that each one of us would grow stronger as we build relationships with each other. That we would tell our story as we connect. And we would hear the stories of others as we connect because it makes us stronger. We know, Lord, that two are better than one, according to your word, and a threefold cord is not easily broken. So, Lord, I declare and decree today that we will build strong bridges. We will build strong relationships. I declare and decree according to your word, according to Job 22, so that it will be established that we will connect to one another. And not only, not only to one another, but we will connect with those in our community, those in our world, to build a bridge to them, to connect with them so they can find the love of God so they can know how awesome you are and what you'll do to set them free we thank you Lord that you are our Savior and we thank you Lord for the strength the hope that we have in you to lead others to you so they can know you and be set free so father I pray now Lord for your blessings to rest on every person here take each one of us to a new level help us to build those strong relationships Give us a hunger and a thirst and a desire for your word so we can grow in your word, so we can grow in our foundation, so we can be more balanced, so we can process when we face challenges in life, and so we can help others process through the storms. Lord, I thank you that we have a family here that has each other's back. 
And we're not here to talk or gossip about one another, but to love one another, to build each other up, to strengthen one another, and to push another person to the next level. So, Father, we love you. We bless you. We honor you today. We need you. We know we're nothing without you. And we call on you. We depend on you right now. Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your anointing that we feel. We thank you for the barrier-breaking anointing that's here. We thank you that you've called Metro Tab to be a gatekeeper church. We don't take it lightly. We pray for all the churches and pastors in our city and in our region. We ask that you bless them and increase them. And we know, Lord, that there are enough lost people to fill all the churches over more than once. So, Lord, bring people from the north, south, east, and west. Bring them to Metro Tab. Bring them to us. Let us be a family to embrace them, to love them, to celebrate them, to push them to another level. And Father, we thank you for who you are, for what you're doing. And Lord, protect us as we go. Give us favor every day. Let us be connected to the right people. Let us walk with good health, with increase. And we give you the praise in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray, amen, amen, and amen. I love you. God bless. Hug somebody. You're dismissed. Have a great day. Don't forget Thursday night, one hour, seven to eight. I'll see you then. You're dismissed.